Hey, what's up guys? So if you watched my 10.2 Affliction Warlock guide video, you know I talked about this one and that, and I've been working on this one for a while, but I've officially compiled a bunch of tips and tricks for you guys, especially for Affliction Warlocks in every single dungeon, and I hope this helps you guys out. Before we jump into it, these are mainly for Affliction, but there's plenty of just general Warlock tips in here, and even if you don't play Warlock, there might be something else for you in here. So thank you guys so much for all the support. Be sure to hit the subscribe button if you want more stuff like this. Check out the Twitch, twitch.tv slash arsenal, all that good stuff. Let's jump right into it with just some general tips, and then we'll jump into each individual dungeon. First off, I want to do just some general tips and tricks that apply to pretty much every dungeon and like a specific affix. Curse of Tongues is one of our best utilities we're bringing in the game this season and not enough people use it. It's great in a bunch of places in every dungeon. I'll be pointing out a ton throughout the video. Your group should be kicking late for maximum value, but it's still good even if they aren't. Also, if you're Affliction, you need to use it after Vile Taint as it will overwrite the curse with Curse of Exhaustion. Bosses and some other mobs can't be slowed, so it won't override it on those, but be careful when using this, especially when using Amplify Curse so you don't waste that. I'm not going to list every single mob, but I will provide a favorite in every dungeon section as I go through, and I might just like slay some of the ones that I, I personally like. But if it has casts, it's worth putting Curse of Tongues on it, in my opinion. And then my last general tip is specifically for the Entangling Affix. You can port break this extremely easy. Just put teleport at your feet, move a little bit, and then teleport quickly, and you'll break it every time. You never really have to worry about this affix as a warlock, unless you need to use your teleport for something else. But that's pretty rare. So always kind of just drop your port at your feet, and then break it quickly, and don't even worry about it. Also, this isn't a tip, but we cannot dispel afflicted. I keep seeing people talk about this. We cannot dispel afflicted with imp. It doesn't work like that. It needs to be more than just a magic dispel. You can help your group dispel other magic effects during afflicted week with the imp, but you can't dispel the afflicted itself. A tall desire. There's a few different routes you can go in here. If you go left, however, there's a trick you can do to help your group, especially if you don't have a druid or somebody else in the group. But you'll want to have your imp out and have it stay in the back of the group and then everybody stacks in melee. And that way, when the Juggernaut does their leap out, it'll just leap to your imp every time, and it won't do any damage to it, and it won't do any damage to your group, and nobody has to dodge it. It works a lot better, in my opinion, with Druid Treants, especially since Rust Druids are pretty popular, but this is something you can definitely do, especially if you're Affliction or Destro. However, you do lose your kick when doing this, so it's something to be extremely aware of. Also, the Colossus on this side gains a stacking buff whenever the troll dies near them. It is purgeable, so if you do have your dog out, you can use Consume Magic on the stacks. As Affliction, this can be a bit tricky, especially when using the Imp. Also, <laughs> you usually sack our pet, so this is just usually something that we don't really do, but it's something to be aware of. Next up, if you're doing Razan and you're currently a Night Elf, you can actually meld this. You may have seen this in other videos, but I just figured I'd toss it in. Essentially, every time Razan does Pursuit, no matter who it's cast on, if you use Shadow Meld, you will instantly cast cancel that Pursuit and he will continue going back into his normal rotation. Also for Razan, I like to put my teleport behind one of the little lips in the middle of the room, depending on where your tank is tanking the boss at, to just quickly teleport his terrifying visage if you need to. Uh, and that way you don't have to, you know, if you're running around too much, you can just do that. You can also put a gate between the two sections. It just kind of helps get your group back and forth if you do have to uh, do one of the pursuits. On Priestess, I like to keep my teleport in the back of the room to quickly grab one of the far bloods every time. Usually just helps your group out. You can also banish the ad that she spawns as well if your group is CCing them instead of killing them. You can also fear them, but banish helps keep them just stay in the same spot. On Yasma, I do like to keep my port somewhere in the middle at first since we should stack the soul ring closer to the middle or if your group is doing another spot. But that way I can just teleport quickly around the room if I need to. Definitely try and be aware of where your teleport should go. The most general tip I can provide for this fight though is to stay grouped up with your tank in melee most of the time and then move out for the soul ring. Usually in front of the boss, but depending on what your group is doing, you know, it's okay if you got to put it behind you. You should absolutely use the ping system for this fight. If you don't have the ping system bound, this is the fight that you should bind the ping system for because you can really help your group coordinate where you need it to go. Also, you can have Dark Pack for every Soul Run cast if you use it on pole. The first one may break if you're targeted by your Racking Pain, but it lines up extremely well, especially if you're running Frequent Donor. Be cautious with your defensives here. You'll need something for every Soul Run almost always. Don't waste it on the Racking Pains. Your healer will usually have you for those. Speaking of that, Amplify Curse is actually really interesting on Yasma as it does affect the cast time of Racking Pain. I think this really helps your healer kind of catch up in between Soul Run casts. So you should try and just keep this on at all times, at least in my opinion, from my experience. Some of the mobs you should focus your cursed tongues on in here are the Witch Doctors, the Augurs, the Confessors, and the Pterodactyls. And then any other mob that casts that you notice, especially like Yasma, try and keep your cursed tongues out if you can. Black Rook Hold. 
At the beginning of this dungeon, focus the Ghastly Protectors. They cast Sacrifice Soul, which makes all other mobs around them take 75% reduced damage, but makes the Protector itself take 200% increased damage. So just slam those. On Amalgam of Souls, the first boss, you can stagger step the damage of Soul Echoes, similar to the Cannons and Freehold, if you remember those. Basically, you have to move three times instead of running around. There's a few weak words that can help with the timing of this, since it's a little uh, tricky. I'll try and put one in the description below. For the adds on this boss, it can also be a little tricky, especially if you're playing Affliction. I try to let two get close to each other, and then Volatane Soul Rot both of them, and then just Shadow Fury if you need to. If you have a Demon Hunter or a DK tank that can group up super easy, wait for that. Also, if you leave one add up and you CC it off to the side, you can just DPS the boss until it gets to 15%, and it won't do any mechanics, and you'll just have to deal with the soul cast at the very end of that. Once it goes into 15%, use your defensives, and you'll be totally fine. For the trash on the way to the second boss, I don't have any specific tips, but Curse of Tongues is great in here for all the casters. Use your Shadow Fear as much as possible. Hallow Terror is really helpful in here, in my opinion, helping stop all the knife dances, all that kind of stuff. For the second boss, if you get I-Beam on you during the second phase, or the intermission phase, whatever you want to call it, you can just jump up and down instead of, you know, running around with it to not spread the fire and to not take any damage from it. It is a little tricky since you might lose your damage uptime and stuff like that, but if you can just jump up and down, not spread the fire around, you can definitely help your group out a little bit. I like to have my teleport in the back of the room in case I need to get out of the middle or around the room really easily. Other than that, make sure you're always focusing the Arcanist first. You might even consider putting Crystal Tongues on this if you want. Uh, I like to try and use Soul Rot, Vile Taint when those come out to get a little bit more Dark Harvest value as well. For the room after the second boss, focus the big Blade Lord dude since they have way more health than the rest of the guys in that room. And you can just kind of branch everything out from there. Uh, try and really help with your Shadow Fury stun in here since you can kind of stun big. Your Most tanks are going to pull pretty big and you can stun everything. Uh, again, I like Hallow Terror in this room as well. But if you're using Motor Coil, on the room with that. Uh, definitely try and stun them whenever they're doing Potion or Breath. Curse of Tongues on the big Felguard guys on your way up to the third boss. Definitely helps with, since there's so many casts there. Just kind of branch all your damage out from those dudes. On third boss, he'll always pick the furthest target to charge, so if you're the furthest, be aware of that, but you should be helping your group bait and not move around too much. If you get a green beam on you from one of the bats around the arena, you'll have a line that will kind of toil you where the direction of the bat is, and that's going to where that's going to be where the, the line of green is going to be coming from. You should try and keep those stacked as close to each other as possible, or you can even stack them on top of each other by dipping in right at the last second before it's cast, and then jumping back out. It'll take a little bit of damage, but it helps keep the whole room a lot more organized and less messy. You can teleport every time you get the smash, use the defensive, all that good stuff. On the trash to the last boss, you can actually sit in these little divots along the wall and the leap won't actually go to you. But if people are near you, you will still get hit by it. So either everyone needs to be up there or everyone needs to be away from you like melee so that you can just sit back there and just keep casting. On the last boss, I do like to keep Curse of Tongues on him. I feel like it doesn't help as much with the Shadow Bolt volleys, but it does a little bit, I guess. The big thing here is on the first part of the phase, he'll do a cast called Whirling Blade that throws a glaive out at a target. You should try and bait that against the wall so that it's not throwing all over the room. That's pretty much the only thing you really need to worry about in this first phase. But the big part is when he goes in between phase one and phase two, he'll do that first Shadow Bolt volley cast before you get the actual like big buff from everything else. That is when you want to be using your strongest defensive to survive that Shadow Bolt volley, especially on Tyrannical. Uh, if your group has darkness, stand in the darkness. However, you don't want to use every defensive because Stinging Swarm on Tyrannical also hits for a ton. So you want to have something for that when that comes up as well, which is usually right after that Shadow Bolt volley. So definitely be aware of that. Other than that, pretty easy fight but that first shadow ball volley is something you need to be very aware of and then every time you get singing swarm dark heart thicket depending on how the first pull is structured if you do pull in the bear or you don't pull in the bear focus the bear if it's in there then watch for kicks on the birds and all that kind of stuff but i just like to focus everything on the bear and then spread it from there and watch everything else i also like to stand on this rock off to the right side i just feel like it helps kind of keep me off the way of the regular of the aberrations and then i can kind of focus on everything that's happening and watch for the birds and all that kind of stuff away from the rest of the pack but still near my healer on your way to first boss, you can use your gate to skip the two bears right before the boss by putting your gate right to the side of it, just like this. And then your whole group can gate and nobody has to pull the bears because nobody wants to pull those bears anyways. For the first boss, the leap will always go on the furthest target, which should usually be you since we're pretty tanky compared to a lot of other classes. So whenever you see the leap is about to happen, you should try and always have a defensive rolling for that beforehand since the bleed is cleared by being at max health. For the trash on the way to second boss, if there's a keeper in the pool, 
always single target that keeper down. You can use Seed of Corruption to spread some corruptions out there and maybe keep Agnes on other things. But if there's a keeper in the pool and there's blossoms, you will never do more damage than that keeper heals for those blossoms. And essentially any AoE damage on those is just completely padding. So you want to just focus the keeper as much as possible. Even if there's two keepers, try and just nuke them down as fast as possible. Also, when finding the blossoms, you can stun or fear their root burst cast instead of having to move so much. I usually just like to howl or shadow fury real quick so you can kind of just keep doing your normal AoE. On second boss, there's a few things we can do here. First off, I mentioned it before, but as long as the roots are close to the boss, you can target them with soul rot and then get your dark harvest axe run, but you need to target the roots themselves, not the boss, because if you do it the other way and target the boss, they won't hit the roots and you won't get the stacks most of the time. Speaking of the roots, there's actually something you can do to help your group here, but as affliction, it's a little tricky sometimes. Essentially, you can soul burn teleport and start running through all of the roots to quickly clear them out. They'll slowly start dying off. As Affliction, we're usually tapped on shards, but if the roots are all super grouped up to each other, which they should be, you can really help your group out so you don't get a bunch of adds here. With that said, druids can do this super easily in cat form, so if you have a resto druid, just let them go in cat form and just blow through it really quickly, but this is something to be aware of in case. The other thing you can do with your teleport on this fight is when the boss is finishing his tank stun ability and the tank is being thrown on you specifically, you can teleport right as the cast finishes, essentially when the tank is in the air, and you will take no damage from the slam ability, which can absolutely help your healer again, because there's definitely some damage that goes out on this fight. On the area to Drustron, nothing too crazy here, but whenever the little slimes die, you should be using defensives as much as you possibly can, because if all of them die at the same time, which usually happens, you will take an absurd amount of damage, and there's essentially no debuff that tells you this, but just use a defensive when those are about to die every time. On the third boss, Dresseron, or the bird as I like to call him, you can get a lot of extra damage if your tank is willing to pull some extra whelps for you, essentially every 30 seconds or whenever they want. And you can also get some extra shards. Other than that, always try and stay as close to the boss, especially during downdrafts, because you won't get as pushed back as far. I like to usually put my teleport somewhere near the boss, wherever it ends up, just to teleport back in quickly if I need to. Right after downdraft ends, you should be ready to start moving because he'll do earth shaking roar immediately after, which leaves like a patch of sauce on the ground. So you don't want to be in that more than one second, especially because it does AOE damage when it first goes out and then standing in that does a bunch more damage. So don't get in that. It's bad. Keep moving. For the trash on the way to the last boss, there is a ton of cast in this hallway. Essentially, always focus the satyrs though, because the imps don't really have a whole lot of health. I always keep Curse of Tongues up on them. I like to focus the stalker or any of the other big satyrs in every pull. Uh, the imps will usually die to cleave damage. For the pack with the bats, I like to try and focus one bat down since it's four mobs. It's a little awkward for affliction damage, but I usually just try and focus one of the bats down as quick as possible and then just keep kind of doing seed around there as well. For the last boss, there's a few ways I've seen this done. The easiest way is everyone just stacks in the corner. And if you get paranoia, you get out and go to the other side of the boss. And if you have the silence, you're already stacked up so you don't have to move. Uh, I like to put my portal towards the middle of the room in case it's not like that and I need to get out of the group very quickly. I'll usually stack with everybody in case I do get the silence so I don't have to move. And then if I get paranoid, I can just quickly teleport out. You should ship cooldowns on pull if you have them. And your defensives should always be used when going into phase two. If you're playing Night Elf, you can meld his feet on the weak cast. You should absolutely do this in phase two. It helps save a ton of damage for your group. One big thing I just want to point out here. A lot of people don't realize the boss gets damage stacks every time he gets hit by one of the pink swirkles on the ground. And the more damage stacks he has, the more afraid you should be of any cast that are going to be on you. So having a weak roar that tracks this or being aware of this is super helpful. Just something to definitely be aware of on this fight. The main mobs you should be keeping Curse of Tongues on in here are the Ruiners at the beginning, the Dwellers in the middle before second boss, and the Summoners on the way to the last boss. Dawn of the Infinite, Galakron's Fall. So I've seen this first pull in here done a few different ways, but it doesn't really matter. If you pull everything on the first boss or not, whatever, always focus the Rippers and then the Chrono Weavers. Those are the most important mobs in these pulls, especially the Rippers have the highest health and the Chrono Weavers have a super deadly cast. On first boss, I like to put my port somewhere in the middle of the room and then I'll usually have to move it around. That way you can just take the Cheeto dust to the edge of the room and then port back to the middle. Sometimes people will drop it on your port, but you can just kind of easily move this around. For the Cheetah Room, focus the Coalesce time, keep Kurt's tongues on them as much as you possibly can, but the big thing I like to watch here is the Innervate cast on the leeches. Those, If those go off, they're really, really bad, and you can help stop a lot of those, especially with Shadow Fury and all that kind of stuff. Also, if you get the Chrono Burst cast from the Coalesce time in this room, the big gigantic circle around you, you don't want to hit any of the little sand ghosts or you'll activate them, so usually taking this to the middle or just being very aware of where your ring is to not hit any of those is super important for your group. For Manifested Timeways itself, the boss, it is a little tricky, but first off, I like to stack up as close as I can to the boss and then just move around the room right behind the orbs as they spawn. That way I don't have to move my feet too much. But the big one is before the dispels go out, we should be watching our timer. 
if you get the dispel you always want to plant your feet in the fast zone so that it goes off instantly and so you don't move when it goes off because if you move you will take damage if you don't move you will not take any damage so i like to if as soon as they're getting ready to go out i'll try and be in the fast zone and i plant my feet instantly and then if i don't get dispelled i'll try and keep up with moving very generously in the in the speed zone watching the debuff is about to fall off most healers will not dispel the second one they'll dispel the first one and just let the one the second one fall off naturally you do take reduced damage when you're in the slow zone so if you don't have the dispel here always try and be in the slow zone as much as you possibly can after manifest time waves you can gate skip the dragon by putting your gate here or if everyone just waits before the dragon spawns you can run as a group and not even have to worry about it at all just run right past it on the third boss, as Affliction, this fight is extremely annoying, just like in Rise. All of our dots actually fall off of this boss, though, whenever it phases. So ship everything you can on pull. And then if the boss is getting close to 70%, don't use anything else because you're going to have to reapply all your dots. And then it does that again at 50%. So it's very awkward as Affliction, but this is something to be super aware of. Another thing, if you're playing Night Elf here in Phase 2 and Phase 3, if you can, you want to meld the Corrosive if it goes on you. So this will help save your group a ton of damage because it will start casting it, you'll meld it, and it won't even go out on the group. It saves your group a ton of damage for passing this thing around. I definitely think it's better to do it in Phase 2, but if you if you don't get it in Phase 2, doing it in Phase 3 is super helpful. Don't do it in Phase 1. Again, when the boss goes into Phase 3 and splits into 2, you need to wait for it to actually change into the dragons before reapplying your dots because they'll fall off again before they change into the dragon, so just kind of wait. Another big thing in this phase, when you get stunned or if somebody in your group gets stunned with the Necrofrost, you can either howl this to instantly break it or you can just cast Fear on it and it will also instantly break it. You don't have to waste any damage on this. Any Disorient will work. On the last boss, during the first part, if you get picked for Extinction Blast and you are Night Elf again, you can meld the initial Extinction Blast cast on you to kind of like save damage from going on you, and then you can use your defensives for the big soak instead of wasting one right before it. Another big thing here is try to use your cooldowns on the boss and not on its shield. Unless your healer is really struggling to make it through the shield phase, you really ideally want to use your cooldowns on actually damaging the boss and getting it into the final phase faster than using it to break the shield since it'll usually make the boss a little bit longer. Our timers are a bit weird here though, so kind of be aware of that, but something to always think about when you're doing this boss. During the phase where you're trying to break the shield and the rock pillars are coming at you, you can play a little bit further back from his hitbox because we're ranged, and you don't have to move as much. You want to always try and stay as close to Chromie as possible though here because your healers usually have to heal her, and so being near Chromie and your group is all near Chromie, it really just helps your healer out and prevents you guys from getting a lot of chaos going on in this phase during the frontal part always go left everybody in the group should go left ping left if you need to everybody goes left you can also get some extra dark harvest damage on cleaving off the ads here this definitely helps a little bit usually our cooldowns are perfect for that and then if the boss is getting close to 90 percent and has 100 percent energy which yeah, around 90 percent he'll have 100 energy that's when he goes into the final phase you want to be watching your cooldowns for this and save things if you need them the mobs to keep curse of tongues on in here are not as long as some of the other ones but chrono weavers and coalesced moments in time and leeches if you really want to, super helpful in this key. Dawn of the Infinite's Murazon's Rise. The first area, always focus any of the mini bosses with as much damage as you possibly can, especially if it's Maiden. You should always try and help bait the orb for Maiden through the trash because it does a ton of damage to them. More of a tank thing, but you can help with the ping system to alert your group of where the orb is and to help your tank out if it's sometimes a huge bull. When you're fighting the snake mini boss guy, he'll always leap out of range, so either bait it towards the edge of the room or towards the pillar in the middle of the room, that way he's not going super far and you guys can easily kick him. Curse of Tongues is great on every caster on this initial platform, any of the mages or anything like that, or magus, whatever they're called. And you can use it on the snake dude if you want, but it doesn't really do a whole lot here. Maiden it also can work on, but it doesn't really do a whole lot. For the first boss, you should always try and maintain all of your dots while grabbing the orbs, ideally. You want to just try and stand near the pillar and DPS and let the orbs come to you, but if you can't, in like a pug situation, you know, it is what it is. Try and save cooldowns for after the pillar orb gather phase since you get a bunch of haste if you got them coming up, but try and maintain and maximize as much possible damage as you can at all times on this fight and really reduce how much time you're waiting for the shield. Save defenses for if you get the big debuff on you and you have to soak, or if the soak is coming and you, you're going to have to help your tank, but defensives is super important here. Also, I've heard people mention about using Imp Dispel on this boss. I would absolutely not recommend doing that unless you are super coordinated with your healer, as you will more than likely kill your team by double dispelling. Instead, I like to use Voidwalker for extra defensive, and if you have it for the next two pulls, since it's the dragon plus the little add, you don't really need to worry about kicking. Most people in your group will do that, and then you have the double dragon. More defensives there is great. The Imp Dispel thing can work, but you really need to coordinate that. For the Gauntlet, if you've been on stream, you know I am not great at this at all. So the only tip that I can really give is if you have people next to you, maybe wait for them because a lot of the times what will happen is you'll all go at the same time and you'll get caught by somebody else's orb. 
Either way, I'm not great at this gauntlet at all, so good luck to everybody. For the Cheetah Room in here, always focus the Rift Mages, keep Cursed Tongues on them at all times, and you should only be kicking Temporal Blasts, as this will kill your tank if it goes off a ton. Depending where you go next, if you do go Morchi, your group may want to use a Gate Skip to get to her to skip the pack in front of her. This skip is by far the worst one this season, in my opinion, and is the trickiest. Essentially, you need to place your Gate around the edge of this corner, but also the edge has a bit of a lip, so you want to put it on the inside. This mob also patrols, so you can only gate at a very certain time. This skip is extremely tedious and painful and is so much easier with just a mind soothe, but it's something to be aware of. For Morgie herself, this boss is extremely annoying as affliction. Our dots don't fall off, but when she transitions, they kind of just hide behind, so you don't really want to use Dark Lit early. But what I can say is, you have just enough time to get all of your dots out, Vile Taint, Soul Rot, and drop your first three Raptures very quickly. Don't Dark Glare, and then that way when you come out of the more problems cast, then you can get your setup going and actually keep maintaining all your dots on there and get full Dark Glare value if you're running that. Before that, don't ship everything. I would highly recommend against Lusting here until after that first phase because he goes into that problems cast basically in 10 seconds. Also, I do have a mod on my player profile, or you can install it on any other player profile, that auto hides your nameplates during the phase when you're trying to find her. Super helpful. You can get my player profile in my Discord, links in the description below. But another big thing here is just make sure you have the ping system. Super helpful to point out where the correct one is for your group. For the trash before the actual battlefield boss, especially the three casters, one of them, whichever it's Horde or Alliance, it doesn't really matter, will cast either an Earthquake ability or a Consecration ability. Whenever that is going out, you want to treat this extremely cautiously and move essentially as soon as the cast finishes. For Battlefield, it seems like a lot of people don't fully understand the boss, but essentially if he hits any of the adds around the room and kills them, he gains stacks of what's called Battle Senses, which does a ton of damage to the whole group and makes him hit your, your tank even harder. So you, ideally you want to bait the frontals along one of the edges, wherever your tank is tanking him. And then if you ever get targeted with Bladestorm, I like to put my teleport on the outside of the room, either on the left or the right, and then just teleport very quickly and kite him around the edges of the room. For the trash pack right before the final boss, the three mobs, I like to try and focus one of the smaller dragons instead of the one in the middle. The one in the middle is the scariest that does the pulsing damage to your entire group. You should absolutely be psyching through the defensives here and watching as your health as much as you possibly can to help your healer. But killing one of the ones on the side faster seems to really help my group's success in most situations. Or if you really, if everyone's super coordinated, you can just try and ship everything on the main one that's pulsing all the AoE damage in the middle and then just spread everything from the side. For the last boss, I'm usually the one staying in the orb, so you should stack with your healer and then just slowly move together around the room. You want to stack up with your healer, keep your feet planted as much as you possibly can, and then watch your group's health to make sure that everybody's healthy before you step out of it. You're a really crucial component of this, and that's something you can really do to help your group out. Always focus the ads during the boss encounter, because the boss health, in my opinion, is essentially just all RP and doesn't really matter as much. Just focus and kill the ads as quick as you possibly can. Lastly, stay in the middle of the room as much as you possibly can during his like dance phase where all the stuff's going over the floor. Because usually your melee and your tank will be along the edges of the room and you don't want to lock them in. But try and stay with your healer in this phase as much as you possibly can. This entire dungeon is extremely tricky as Affliction, so, you know, go with caution. Some of the mobs that keep your curses on are obviously the mages in the beginning, the marauders, and then the rift mages as much as possible, and the three pack right before the battlefield boss. The Everbloom. On the first pull, it depends on how it's pulled, but I like to focus the naturalists and then branch everything from them. Curse of Tongues on them, it really helps as well, but again, if you're running Affliction, you want to do that after you do Vile Taint. This is super helpful because they're the ones that cast the Choking Vines cast and need to be stopped immediately, especially if it's on you. Any pull that has a Naturalist or a Mender or any of the other casters in it, you should be focusing those. If you do have a pull that has Abomination or Berserker in it, you do want to focus the Abomination a little bit more. And then watch the Berserkers for whenever they're going to do the Leap cast and try and pre-move as much as you possibly can. On the first boss, the timings can be a bit weird, but shipping cooldowns during his amp phase is definitely worth saving in my opinion, unless you're going to have to wait way too long, but most of the time they line up pretty well, especially if you shipped them on the pack before. When you get unchecked growth, which I basically get on cooldown, the roots that it drops can actually get two water orbs if the orbs are near each other, so try and catch that if you can. There is a gate skip that I like to use behind the hut to easily get the second boss. I've talked about this a few times, but here's a clip of how to do that. Okay, here you go. I'll, I'll set you up right here, buddy. You come through this this little hut right here, right? Go through this hut. Then you find this little ledge like this right here. I see a little line of green right there. You go to this. And then when your camera zooms out, you're going to turn your camera so I can see this spot right here, right? See that little patch of green right there? And you're gonna grab your thing and you're gonna put it right where see like the edge of my reticles right there boom that's it 
for the second boss, you should Amp Curse on Tulu, as he's the one that spams Nature's Wrath and Toxic Bloom the stun, and then keep Normal Tongues on Gola, the one that just heals and does the Water Bolts. I used to reverse this, but Gola does his channel for a whole long time, so it's not really worth it. It's way more worth it to have on the Nature's Wrath guy and Toxic Bloom guy, since those are the casts that are just being silly being spammed out the entire time. This fight is a bit tricky as Affliction, but try to keep at least Agony on all three, and then ideally Corruption and Siphon Life as you can, and then Nuke Tulu. For the trash to third boss, keep Cursed Tongues on all the different mages. It helps a ton here since these kicks are basically all deadly. Uh, play far back for the Spatial Disruption or like the Arcane Orb cast. Prioritize the Pyromancers and any pull that they're in. For the kicks, you should be worrying about Pyroblast and then Arcane Blast and then Frostbolt. Uh, Amp Curse works wonders on these mobs. On third boss, keep Curse of Tongues on her and pop Dark Pact on pull since the Cinderbolt phase is the most damage she's going to do. So it goes immediately into Cinderbolt, so Dark Pact on pull always helps with that. You want a defensive for every single Cinderbolt Storm phase she has if you can. Usually it's Dark Pact and then I do Resolve and then Dark Pact will be back up and Resolve might be back up. So basically watch a health zone for the next one. But it always goes two Cinderbolt phases and then nothing. Just a regular phase with Frost and then like the Arcane Orb and then two Cinderbolt phases again. Ideally, you're the one in your group that's playing far back and baiting the Arcane Orb with a Spatial Disruption that's going to suck everybody towards it. So that way you can just put your Teleport down, be in the back, teleport quickly if you need to. And then I like to ping where the Arcane Orb is going to land so my whole group knows where it's going to be. On the last boss, there's a few things you could do here. Firstly, I like to play Soul Swap for this fight since the add is a huge priority and needs to die as fast as possible. Soul Swap helps with that tremendously. Also, you really only want to use your defensives whenever the ad is up and the boss is about to do his Colossal Blow. That's when you're going to take the most damage in the fight. Outside of that, your healer should usually have you. So try and save Dark Pack for that every single time and then resolve if you need it. Also, another little trick you can do here, if your group is okay with it, let a few of the Lashers go off so you can get Dark Harvest value every single time because it's usually synced up perfectly with that phase. And it'll just help funnel a little bit more into the boss and give you some free shards on top of that. Throne of the Tides. There are a ton of mobs for curses in here. Basically, any mob that has a cast is bad, so you should keep Cursed Tongues on as many as you can and then keep Weakness on the Sentinels. If you get Crushing Depths here, you should really Soul Burn a Hellstone here. It'll help save you and help save your healers from stuff. However, be aware here, you can't Hellstone if you're at max health, so you may need to wait until you get a little, little below max and then ship it. On the first boss, you should ideally stack around the boss to chain the lightning back to the tank. It's a group thing, but try your best here. It is a little tricky, but it's something to be extremely aware of during this fight. Curse of Tongues also works well on this boss, so keep that up as much as you possibly can, especially with Amp Curse. On second boss, you should try to have Dark Pact for every single knock. It usually lines up very well. And then put your Teleport down and teleport instantly right after you get knocked so you don't have to fly around the room. I've mentioned it briefly in another video, but essentially you can target the little goops that the boss spawns and get Dark Harvest stacks. If they're close enough to the boss, he'll still get Soul Rod on him, so definitely something to be aware of. It's a little tricky, so use this with caution. On the way to the next boss, the watchers that pull you in with their like grasping tentacles cast or whatever, that can be line of sighted, or you can just put a teleport down and click a teleport out, but it doesn't line up very well, so I just recommend line of sighting it if you can. On the third boss, there's actually a few things we can do here to help our group out. First up, you should have Curse of Weakness on this boss at all times. Your tank is getting absolutely slammed on this fight, and reducing its attack speed helps your tank a ton and your group as a whole. Second, if you're Aff or Destro, you should have your Imp out and help dispelling the Flame Shock as much as you can. The timings on this don't exactly line up or make it the easiest, so it's a little weird, but you may want to coordinate with your healer or just watch your party to help the most you can. I usually dispel the third and sixth Flame Shock whenever I see it is up or if it's up longer than like a couple seconds on a person and I have my Dispel. This can be super helpful on Afflicted Weeks since we cannot Dispel the Afflicted, but we can Dispel the Magic Buff on our party members. Also, I just want to note here, we cannot Dispel Afflicted Mobs. People keep thinking we can. Afflicted Mobs take more than a Magic Dispel. We only have a Magic Dispel with Imp. So we can't Dispel Afflicted Mobs, but we can help our group Dispel Magic Effects during Afflicted Weeks at the cost of our kick. On the gauntlet area, the last boss, try and focus as much damage as you possibly can on the sentries since you take more damage from the swells, especially if you have the dot from the corruptions. Use stuns and AoEs here to stop to help control the packs with the aqua mages and like any of the hunters you pull those. You can use curse here as much as you want as well. On the last boss, there's really no crazy tricks here, but focus on clearing the goop on the floor if you have the water as much as you can, especially because this fight can spiral out of control extremely quickly if people aren't clearing enough. Help kick any of the adds that are far away if your tank can't get them quickly, because not only do you not want these casts to go off because they do a ton of damage, but you want all the adds to die close to each other since they also drop goop on the ground so it's easy to clear up with all the water. Mobs to curse in here are basically everything, but oracles, witches, the first boss, Lady Najajar, she can keep amp cursed, curse of exhaustion on the sentinels, and the stone speaker. There's tons of curses in here just use as much as possible again. Waycrest Manor. 
Always focus the Rune Weavers and any other Witch Ladies in this dungeon. Curse of Tongues works great on them, especially if you're running Amp Curse. Uh, if you are Nelf, you can actually meld the etch when it finishes the cast and is actually channeling on you, and it won't just instantly recast it. If you meld too early, it will. For the Coven fight, there's a couple of things to be aware of, especially as Affliction. First up, Curse of Tongues on all of them is fantastic, especially with Amp Curse. They cast the entire time, so you reduce a ton of damage going on in your group. Always kick one of the Witches that isn't the active one, because the active one will usually be casting on your tank. I do like to use Soul Swap on this fight as well. You can see what I did in the key that just came out on the YouTube, but depending on the key level, you can swap really easily every time they phase. It usually lines up extremely well. Just be ready when they get close to 50% around the first phase that you'll want to be able to swap, so maybe save a shard for that. You don't really need to worry about any of your other dots on the other ones, except I like to maintain Agony just for the extra shard gen because they do take 99% reduced damage, so I don't need to really worry about that. And also because of that, you need to be extremely careful when using Dark Lure on this fight. If you take too long at the very beginning or you get mind controlled like I do every single time, you wanna try and get your Dark Lair out as fast as you possibly can because your Dark Lair will not change targets if the boss changes the orb. So your Dark Lair might be just losing any of its damage that's already pretty weak on a target that's taking 99% reduced damage. So definitely be aware of that. For the trash in the courtyard area, there's a ton of witches out here. Maintain Curse of Tongues as much as you can on here. Again, the Vile Taint thing applies. So Vile Taint first, then Curse of Tongues. Uh, it also helps with the Gorgers in this room as well. All the casts that happen in here are really bad. For Soulbound Goliath, Soul Swap is super helpful here. It doesn't line up with every single Thorns cast, but try and be super mindful of if your group is going to have a mage that can blink it or a pally that can bop it or use their own thing or a human racial or PvP trinket. But having Swap for this fight in the situations where you might not have an out like that can really help you catch back up and get a little bit more priority damage on those Soul Thorns. And since we're already running it for Coven, it's really not a loss. Also, I like to try and wait if I have Soul Rot and Vile Take coming back up just in case for the Soul Thorns so that I can hit it and at least get another stack of Dark Harvest. For Raw, I like to put my port on one of the sides of the room. Doesn't matter which one, just so you can quickly teleport for his frontal if you need to. The other big thing I can say here is if you're running Hall of Terror or just regular Fear, the adds on this fight act, interact really strange with Fear and they basically triple their movement speed whenever you Fear them. So what I like to do is I like to run to the one of the sides and Howl, the one that's coming out from the far side, so that he'll run towards the two in the middle and then I'm at least helping group up three of them. Uh, this can definitely help your group out, especially if you don't have anything to help group them up quickly. I've also talked about be sure to always target the adds with your Soul Rod here to get a bunch of Dark Harvest stacks. If you target Rawl himself, you won't get the stacks from Dark Harvest most of the time, but if you target the adds, your Soul Rod will still hit Rawl. For all the witches in the basement and the ones in front of Lord and Lady, you can LOS their cast behind the pillars in this room. This definitely depends on how your tank is doing it, but something to be super aware of. Curse of Tongues is super helpful in this room as well. For Lord and Lady Waycrest themselves, you can actually kick her racking core cast while she's on the stage. You should definitely do this to help mitigate damage to your group. I also like to keep an agony on her for extra shards and Curse of Tongues, especially with Amp Curse, to just help slow down those casts when I can't kick them. Another big tip for this fight that's a little interesting to do while we're trying to kick this, she only casts her like purple circles on the ground to the closest three targets to her. So you can actually go in, kick her, reapply your dots, and then move to the back of the room again, especially if you have two other melee or three, a tank plus two melee that are gonna be in the front, and they'll get all the circles and you won't have to move as much. For Gorak Tool, keep Curse Tongues on him. He does have a cast time and it will help with that. Soul Rot and Vile Taint with every add should be up almost every single time to help get your dots on those. You can kind of keep your Raptures going on Gorak Tool or on the adds, but you want to try and stay as, as many dots as you can on the adds as frequently as you can. Don't let those adds get too far. You can Soul Swap if you really need to, but I usually don't do that. Lastly, like I mentioned, some of the mobs keep your Curse Tongues on are Rune Weavers, any other Witch, Coven, the Gorgers, Lady Waycrest, and Gorg Tool. There's a ton of value of Curse Tongues in here, so try and keep, keep that up as much as you can. Well, guys, I think that about wraps it up for every dungeon. I do hope this helped you guys out. I'm sorry this took so long. I put a ton of effort in this one, and it took a long time just to even compile all of this info into one video uh, and find all the different clips and get footage for all this stuff, so I really do hope it helps you out. Uh, I'm sure there's plenty of things that I missed, so feel free to drop a comment and you know, let me know if there's something I did miss or come by the Discord and let me know. I'm always down for more trips and more tricks and all that kind of stuff. There's tons of gate skips this season. I love finding all that stuff out. So if you need more Affliction info, be sure to check out the 10.2 guide. There's plenty of good stuff in there still. Uh, builds have changed, but I got a bunch of videos on the, stream, on the page about different builds that I like right now. And you know, you can always come by the stream and ask me questions. Twitch.tv slash arson, all that good stuff. I'm always down to help. Also... If you need any help with anything else, be sure to join the Discord like I already said. And if this helped you guys out, please hit the subscribe button. I'd appreciate that. We just passed 3K subs, which is insane. So thank you guys so much for all that and all the support over on the stream. Thank you again for watching. I'll see you guys in the next one.